Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Jenny Hargrave and I'm the Director of Health Programmes and I'll be your chair today for today's live and ticking event, which is going to be focusing on cardiac arrest and CPR. Um, so just to start off the proceedings today, a um, bit of a question for you. Just wanted to talk about the difference between a cardiac arrest and a heart attack. So what do we mean by a cardiac arrest? As you'll see from the slide, um, the cardi a cardiac arrest is when your heart starts stops suddenly beating um, a pump and pumping bl blood around your body. Um, when your heart stops pumping blood, your brain is starved of oxygen, and this causes you to fall unconscious and stop breathing. Cardiac arrest is often fatal, and if appropriate steps aren't taken immediately, this is when CPR or cardiopulmonary resuscitation should be administered. So how would you, as, uh, 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 how would you rate your understanding of cardiac arrest? It's a poll question for you. You'll see on the polls that you can um, do um, one as, as very little and five meaning a lot. We're just getting the results in now, Jenny. That's fine. Okay, so end the poll. So 11% said a lot, 24% said four, 34% said three, 22% said two, and 8% said very little. Interesting. Okay, so second question. So it's just, just a little bit of a bit, bit of background for you. In the UK, there are currently over 30,000 out of hospital cardiac arrests each year. And that's, hosp that's um, obviously um, a cardiac arrests that happen outside of a hospital setting. So um, survival rates for that are actually pretty low, but do you know what the survival rate is in the, for, for someone having a cardiac arrest outside of the hospital in, in the UK? Is it A, less than 50%, B, less than 30%, or C, less than 10%? Give you a bit of time to respond. So I'm going to just give the results now. So 14% said less than 50%, 29% said less than 30%, and 57% said less than 10%. Oh, we've got a very, uh, very clever audience. 10%, less than 10% is in fact the correct answer. Um, if you have a cardiac arrest in the UK today, you have, le you have a less than one in 10 chance of surviving. But early CPR and defibrillation can double your chances of survival in some cases. In the early 1960s, heart and circulatory disease was epidemic. The risk of sudden cardiac, cardiac death at the age of only 50 or 60 was so common, it was considered by doctors and the public alike to be just a fact of life. In 1961, heart and, circula heart and circulatory diseases were actually responsible for over half of all deaths in the UK. So a group of medics felt that this was not an acceptable situation going forward and decided to form the BHF to see if they could find out the reasons and, and, and enter into research. One of the BHF's early pioneers was Desmond Julian. He went on to become the BHF's first medical director in the, in the 1980s and worked tirelessly to introduce effective cardiac emergency care in UK hospitals. By the mid-1960s, if you suffered a cardiac arrest, you stood a good chance of being successfully resuscitated, but only if you happened to be in hospital at the time. So what about the much larger group of people who suffered cardiac arrest at home, at work, or in the street? The answer, of course, was to take emergency equipment to them. The first person to act on this logic was Dr. Frank Partridge. So with a little help from the increasingly influential BHF, on the 1st of January 1966, Pantridge took, took his mobile flying squad into the outside world and began delivering resuscitation to patients at home. His mobile defibrillator was actually just a hospital machine that was converted to run on two car batteries and weighed nearly 70 kilograms, that's the equivalent of a human being 
some human beings. He obtained an old ambulance to carry the converted defibrillator and drugs and other, and other re requirements normally available in hospital, only available in hospitals, into patients' homes. Using a grant of £2,300 from the BHF, um, this financed the operation of the unit for the first year. And after the first year, Partridge was reporting that in Belfast, which was a medium-sized city, the team could now reach 85% of patients within 15 minutes and 50% within 10 minutes. The Belfast equipment was widely acclaimed and the idea was quickly taken up in the USA. Today, we're creating a nation of white lifesavers. The BHF has trained millions of people around the UK in essential life-saving skills and, dis and distributed thousands of defibrillators throughout the country. With others, we've helped convince governments to put CPR on the school curriculum across all four UK nations. So a generation of young people will leave school knowing life-saving skills. Our Call Push Rescue program also means that 88% of all secondary schools have received and are using BHF CPR training kit. And you'll see a picture of that on your screen. But our work is not done. With survival rates still shockingly low, we need to make sure that everyone in the UK has access to these essential skills and knows where their nearest defibrillator is. Therefore, we have developed the following resources. The circuit is a national defibrillator network, which is led, a BHF led and funded, um, funded new centralized database of defibrillators. It synchronizes with live dispatch systems within every ambulance service in the UK. That's 14 ambulance services. And since it's, since it's gone live, only 30, uh, sorry, over 37,000 defibrillators have been registered already. And we hope to see that, that, that this will increase to 60,000 by the summer of 2022. We've also recently launched Reviver CPR. This will help you to learn um, to do CPR and use it and, and, and learn how to use a defibrillator in just 15 minutes using your mobile phone or a tablet. And you'll see that there is actually a, a link in your in your sidebar there so you can have a go um, after this presentation. So while support and resources are vital, the BHF is also fundamentally here to fund world class medical research. We want to better understand the link between survival rates and administration of CPR, as well as how best to treat patients who have had cardiac arrests. We'll be hearing more about this from Professor Simon Redwood's clinical trial um, on treating CPR patients later in the event. But first, I'm absolutely delighted to hand over to David Jeffrey. Um, he'll be sharing his powerful experience of being resuscitated after he suffered a cardiac arrest. David, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Hello everybody, my name is David Jeffrey and I survived an out of hospital cardiac arrest in uh, 2016 uh, when I was 53 years old. So to give you a bit of a background, um, an IT professional um, at the moment, I used to be a physicist by training, so nothing particularly special. Prior to the event, I was fit and healthy, um, slightly overweight, um, slightly elevated blood pressure, but no real risk factors. Um, to give you an indication of the fitness, I'd run um, a marathon. I wanted to do it before I was 50. Um, and then I ran it again the following year to prove it wasn't a midlife crisis marathon, which obviously makes it more of a midlife crisis. Um, but I was fit and healthy. Um, I was working in the city of London and I used to go swimming two or three times a week. Um, so on this particular day, it was July 7th, 2016. Uh, I went to work normally in the morning. I did a morning's work, decided to go for a swim. Um, so I left the office, went to a local gym, which has a swimming pool in the basement, got changed and um, went for a swim. So nothing um, out of the ordinary. I felt well. I had no signs of anything beforehand. Now, I'm not a great swimmer. Um, I normally swim breaststroke, but this day the, the fast lane of the pool was empty. So I picked it up and down that, did 500 metres, which was normal, got out of the pool. And now, as it was a baking hot day, I think it was about 25, 30 degrees outside, I thought I'd sit on a lounger by the side of the pool, let my heart rate slow down and breathe and get back to normal. And when I was lying there, um, that's where I first had a heart attack and then very quickly afterwards, cardiac arrest. Um, 
My memory of event is somewhat vague, but the whole thing was captured on CCTV, so I know the full details of my arrest, and I'm one of the few people who's ever watched himself have cardiac arrest and be resuscitated. So lying on a lounger, I sat up, hand to my chest with central chest pain, and from onset of the symptoms, the cardiac arrest was about five seconds. So very, very quick. Now, um, lifeguard rushed to my aid, but because I had dis displaying something called agonal gasps or agonal breathing, and this is a your body's reflex to um, low oxygen, the brainstem reflex. It looked like I was breathing, I was gurgling, and my left arm started shaking. So this was mistaken for a seizure. So I was pulled off the lounger onto the tiles of the swimming pool and put into the recovery position, which if it was a seizure, it was actually a reasonable thing to do. But in cardiac arrest, it's precisely the wrong thing to do. So I was in that recovery position for about three minutes without CPR. And then it was realized I'd gone a very funny color. My head had gone very, very blue. And I looked pretty lifeless. So then I was rolled onto my back and then CPR was started. Um, no defib was had arrived at this point. And bear in mind, the defib was about five meters away at the reception of the, the gym. Um, but no one had bothered to get the defib at that point. So CPR was started. Um, the chap who saved my life did such good CPR that I started my agonal breathing again, which was mistaken for normal breathing. And I was rolled back into the recovery position. Again, the wrong thing to do, just continue with CPR in this situation. And finally, the defibrillator arrived, um, pads put on my chest, and then I was shocked. And with one shock, it restarted my heart um, and started breathing again. Now, this was... Um, the whole thing, resuscitation was done by staff at the pool. The London ambulance turned up very, very quickly, but they can't get to everyone. Um, it, it, they'll get there in eight or nine minutes. They couldn't get to me in two or three minutes. So the CPR and the defibrillator shock was essential for my survival. Um, when London ambulance staff arrived, I'd actually um, sat up and started talking just before they walked in. So they couldn't believe that I'd been in cardiac arrest before that. And it was only when they saw the defib and the um, gym staff had explained that they'd given me one shock that they believe I'd actually was in cardiac arrest. So I was treated by London ambulance staff, uh, carted off to Bart's Hospital in an ambulance. Um, I caused traffic chaos in central London that day and they closed the road outside the gym for me for the ambulance and I think a police car turned up. So there was chaos in central London. Into Bart's, into the capital lab. Well, they checked out the arteries in my heart, stented um, one artery, and then sent me off to the ward for recovery. Um, the, looking back on this, I was incredibly lucky. I think if someone hadn't been there to give me CPR and there hadn't been a, a defibrillator, I wouldn't be speaking to you now. I would be ashes in the urn on the mantelpiece. Um, Bart's Hospital looked after me very well. I spent about a week in hospital, and then I got sent home with a carry bag of medication um, and told to go and see my GP and, and life went back to normal. Um, after this event, I probably spent about four or five weeks at home convalescing and then I went back to work. And about six weeks after the event, I actually went back to the same, same swimming pool and swam in the same lane, although I didn't swim on the same lounger again. I waited till the one year anniversary of the event where I did swim in the same lane and I sat on the same lounger, but this time I uh, didn't have a cardiac arrest. The CCTV uh, footage of my incident is very interesting, though um, you could consider it disturbing. When I first saw it, I felt it was rather disturbing how fat I looked in a pair of swimming trunks, but fortunately they weren't speedos. But they give very interesting um, footage of the whole arrest incident, the uh, CPR, the agonal respiration, what the shock from defibrillator, defibrillator looks like. It's not like you see in casualty on the television, it's quite brutal. And I've had a number of DC cardioversions for a, a, a cardiac arrhythmia. And I can tell you, it feels like being hit by a truck, the, the shock from one of that, uh, those devices. Um, so I've made a full recovery. I didn't get a hypoxic brain injury, even though my heart stopped for just over seven minutes. And I think it's because of the quality of the CPR that I received and the early defibrillation to restart my heart that I didn't get a brain injury. Um, so I've made full recovery. I've gone back to normal life. I'm fit and healthy again. I'm about 20 kilos lighter than I was when I rested. Um, and to all intents and purposes, as though it never happened to me. Um, since that time, I've trained as a volunteer responder with my local ambulance service. 
and I have been out to um, five cardiac arrests. So I've had two um, who managed to resuscitate and three who unfortunately didn't. And I think there's one person alive because of the interventions that I made that I was first on scene. It was about eight minutes before the ambulance crews turned up and that person I know survived to leave the hospital. So I feel I've achieved some sort of um, payback uh, for the care that I've received. Um, and subsequent to that as well, I've trained, uh, done additional qualifications, and I'm about to start uh, a job as frontline ambulance crew. So hopefully I will be able to repay what happened to me um, in my local community. Um, that's about the end of my story. I've got not much, uh, I, I can wrap it on for longer, but I don't think there's anything more e exciting to add. So if I hand back and then I'll take some questions at the end. That's great. Thanks very much, David. Um, what a powerful experience and, and how well and um, beautifully presented. So thank you so much for, 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 tell it, for sharing your story. Um, I'd now like to introduce Professor Simon Redwood, um, who's going to talk to you about his research and his career um, and into sudden cardiac arrest. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much. I hope you can see my slides. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, just very briefly about cardiac arrest and uh, a little bit about the trial that we've been running. Thanks, thanks to the very generous support of the British Heart Foundation. So first of all, just as a background, I'm a cardiologist. I work at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. Uh, I've been there for about 26 years and I've developed, a, I mean, as cardiologists, we're all interested in cardiac arrest, but I developed a research interest in cardiac arrest about 10 years ago, um, following an invite to give a talk uh, about the hospital management of cardiac arrest. And I realized that it, it really does vary depending on where uh, which hospital you get sent to and uh, whether you go to a cardiology unit or not. And that, that sort of stimulated my research and stimulated the trial, which I'll mention very briefly in a few minutes. So a lot of this you've already heard. Um, so here are some of the facts about cardiac arrest. Um, earlier on, you heard that there were over 30,000. Actually, there's over 60,000 house hospital arrests in the UK per year. That's because of the way we count them. If you count every single cardiac arrest, including the ones that don't receive any resuscitation, then actually it's, it's over 60,000. Resuscitation is only attempted about a half of patients. So half of those 60,000, which is where you get the 30,000 from. And importantly, in the community, only about a third of the community would even attempt CPR. And as you've heard earlier, the survival to discharge is only about 10%. So one in 10 or 90% of those patients will die. Um, and just a few other facts about cardiac arrest. The average age is, uh, is 65 and 65% of, of the patients are male. The peak time to have a cardiac arrest is in the morning on either a Sunday or a Monday and in December and January. So those are the, the riskiest times to, uh, to have a cardiac arrest. And very importantly, the vast majority of cardiac arrests occur at home. So up to 80% of cardiac arrests occur at home. Only 20 to 30% occur in the public. Uh, and the most common place is actually in the street. If you actually have a cardiac arrest in a gym or in a uh, train station or in an airport, your survival is very high. And that's usually because there will be lots of people around. Somebody you hope would be happy to perform CPR and hopefully there'll be a defibrillator uh, nearby as you just heard from that wonderful story. So what causes cardiac arrest? Well, here you'll see there's a number of potential causes. Really the only thing to, to bear in mind is that by far the commonest cause is a cardiac cause. Uh, as you've heard from the story, uh, in that case, it was an acute myocardial infarction or a blockage of one of the coronary arteries, which caused irritability and caused the heart to, um, to stop pumping and go into cardiac arrest. So that's by far the commonest cause. And this is quite an interesting slide, and it, it gives a good background to the reason uh, that we perform, that we are performing this trial. If you look at just the left-hand side, so that's all patients that have a cardiac arrest. The survival to actually getting to a hospital is 36%, but the survival to discharge uh, of a patient that's had a cardiac arrest is only 11%, 10 to 11%. So as I said, one in 10 or 
nearly 90% of patients will die before they get discharged from hospital. But on the right-hand side, if you look at the patients that actually go to a heart attack center, and by a heart attack center, I mean a unit which has a cardiology unit with a cath lab, so they have the ability to perform angioplasty as an emergency in somebody that we presume is actually having a heart attack as a cause of their cardiac arrest. And their survival to hospital is 89%, and the survival to discharge is 45%, so much, much higher than the overall 11%. And so you may well say, quite rightly, well, it's far better to be admitted to a heart attack center because my survival is going to be a lot higher. And now that may be the case, but it also may be that the paramedics that first attend to a cardiac arrest see a patient, think it's a cardiac cause, think it's a heart attack, and reroute the patient to a heart attack center. So it's probably a combination of things. And if, for, if I give you just maybe a very extreme example, if a paramedic goes to a 30 year old patient and thinks that they're having a heart attack, they've had a cardiac arrest, they're more likely to take them to a heart attack center than if they go to say a 95 year old patient in a nursing home that has a cardiac arrest, they may be more likely to take them to the local a and &E, not to a heart attack center. So there probably is some bias in terms of where the patients are sent, but nevertheless, there does appear to be a much higher survival if you go to a heart attack center. And so what we wanted to do was find out and investigate this in a, in a scientific way. And the way we, we're doing that is through this, what we call the arrest trial. And what we're doing is we're taking patients that have had a cardiac arrest out of hospital. They're attended by a paramedic. In this case, it's London Ambulance, because this is a London-led trial. And the paramedic determines that they think this is a cardiac cause. Uh, the patient has been successfully resuscitated, and they will be transferred either directly to a heart attack center and treated as if they're having a heart attack, or they'll be treated in the standard fashion, which is to go to the nearest accident emergency department. And what we're doing is we're taking patients, so as I mentioned, thought to have a cardiac cause for their out of hospital arrest. They've had a successful initial resuscitation. We're not including patients that have clear evidence of acute heart attacks on their ECG because as you've heard from that lovely story, if you do have an acute heart attack, you're far better off going to a heart attack center and, and having an attempt at reopening the blocked artery because we know that reduces your risk of recurrence. So those patients are not being included in the trial. And what we're doing is we're following all these patients. They're being randomized one-to-one. -one, so it's just like flipping a coin. Half the patients will go to a heart attack center. Half the patients will go to the local a &E, And we're looking at how many of those patients die at 30 days. And then we're also looking at a number of other things, including longer term outcomes at one year, any in hospital complications they have. And then we're also um, asking patients to complete quality of life questionnaires to see if their quality of life is better if they're treated in a heart attack center. And this trial has now been running uh, for a number of years. We started in 2017. We were on target, as you'll see from this graph, until uh, early 2020 to achieve our uh, recruitment and finish the trial. And we should have finished the trial actually last year, but then COVID came in the way and that stopped us from recruiting because London Ambulance were completely overwhelmed with dealing with the COVID pandemic. And then we briefly restarted again um, last summer and then halted again when there was a, a second sort of wave of COVID. And we've now restarted again and we've restarted properly in November and we're back on target in terms of our recruitment rate, hopefully we'll be finishing the trial in September of this year. And what we've done is, a, is a, we've done some careful statistical analysis, and I won't go through that in detail, but essentially we've shown that if we can use, if we can include 860 patients in the trial, then we have a very good chance of showing that there is a reduction in the death rate in patients that are treated um, in, in the heart attack center. That's what we're hoping we will show. And if we do show that, then that will probably pave the way to change the way that we manage these patients once they're picked up by an ambulance. So that essentially is the trial. It's a very high-end trial. It's only looking at the patients that have had successful resuscitation. It's only looking at the patients that actually make it to hospital. And I'm just going to come back and reiterate what's been talked about a lot in the last couple of talks. It's very important that we all realize, it's a bit humbling, but less than half of patients who have 
an out-of-hospital out cardiac arrest will receive bystander CPR. So only 30 to 40%. And it is incredibly important um, to, to recognize that. And the reason it's important is because early CPR is by far the most important thing we can possibly do to help these patients, without a doubt. It's not us in the cath lab. And we need to remove, we need to move away from situations like this where someone collapses in the street or in a train station or in an airport and everybody just stands and watches and doesn't do anything about it. And I just sort of, just to reiterate, I'll tell you a little story. I, not so long ago, was treating a patient that had an out of hospital cardiac arrest. They were resuscitated by a policeman and he came to the cath lab. He had a blocked artery. We reopened the artery, and after the case, I came out to the control, and the policeman was still there, and he said to me, I just I hope you don't mind, I, I hung around, because this is the first time I've performed um, bystander CPR, and I was the first person on site. And then he said to me, you know, it's amazing what you guys do. You've reopened this guy's, you reopened his, his artery, you saved his life. And I said, no, 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 I haven't saved his life. You've saved his life. I've done nothing. You actually saved his life by performing CPR. Because if you hadn't done that, the patient would have died before he arrived to us. All I've done is reduce the risk of him having a recurrence of a cardiac arrest and hopefully having a better quality of life by reopening his artery. And it's a very, very important point that what we do in hospital is only a very, very small part of the total treatment of cardiac arrest. And just to reiterate why that's so important is that on the left-hand side, you'll see this is the percentage survival on the y-axis, the time from cardiac arrest on the x-axis. And there's a very direct inverse relationship between the survival rate and the time from arrest to when you start CPR. Even if you wait nine or 10 minutes, your survival is awful. Um, and so it's incredibly important that as soon as you see someone collapse, that, um, that you perform CPR, you're very unlikely to do them any harm by performing CPR, you're very likely to do them a massive benefit. Um, so if anything, if the only thing you take away from all of our talks is learn how to do CPR and do it very, very promptly when you see someone collapse. And just to reiterate, you know, the vast majority of cardiac arrests occur at home. So it's very important to make sure that all your family members have been trained in cardiac arrest. And that's one of the reasons why the British Heart Foundation and other organizations are so keen to train schools, for example, school children in doing CPR because, you know, their parents may have a, God forbid, their parents may have a cardiac arrest and it's likely to occur at home and they're likely to be the first responder. You've heard a lot about public access defibrillators. They're undoubtedly important, but just to put it in perspective, this is a couple of years old. This is one year's data for the use of public access defibrillators. And you'll see they're only used in about 100 patients out of all the defibrillators that are around the country, only a hundred times they've been used in patients. And that's because people are scared to use them. You know, they're all over the place and they're actually very, very easy to use and they have very clear instructions on them. And so, uh, you know, you can get very easy and quick training on how to use these defibrillators from the British Heart Foundation and from the Resuscitation Council. Um, and it's very, very important. If you do have access to a defibrillator or if a patient has access to a defibrillator and they are defibrillated, their survival is excellent. It really is very, very good. Now, I just um, some of this has already been mentioned. The British Heart Foundation is doing some phenomenal work in, in the cardiac arrest scenario, not only with our trial, which, as I mentioned earlier, is only a very small part of the pathway in cardiac arrest, but they're doing lots of CPR training. Um, they're trying to make the whole you know, country, a generation of lifesavers so that everybody knows how to do CPR. They're trained in complete schools, in the workplace, in community. They supply CPR kits. They supply defibrillators to school. Um, in conjunction with the Resuscitation Council, there's a specific restart at Heart Day uh, with lots of publicity on cardiac arrest. And you heard earlier, earlier about the Reviver app, which is a very quick course in how to do CPR. One of the questions somebody had was about the Good Sam app. That's an app that's available on the iPhone and, and other smartphones. And if you have been trained in CPR, you can register on this and it will alert you to where a cardiac arrest has occurred. And it will also tell you where the, low, where the nearest defibrillator is. And so it can be very useful uh, in successfully resuscitating patients. 
This just briefly is another app called Life, uh, sorry, another website called Lifesaver. Um, please go to that. It's life-saver.org.uk. They've got some nice training on uh, how to do cardiac arrest, and you can download that on your iPhone and Android phone as well. So in summary, uh, cardiac arrest occurs in over 60,000 patients per year in the UK. The vast, vast majority occur at home, up to 80%. Overall survival is terrible, it's only 10%, but there is a lot we can do about it. If you happen to have a witness cardiac arrest and the patient is lucky enough to get immediate CPR and a defibrillator is used, then survival is greater than 30%. So it's still not 100%, but it's a lot better than 10%. And by far the single most important predictor of survival is bystander CPR. So on that note, I will stop and, and open this to questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Simon. That's, that's absolutely superb presentation and we really appreciate the, uh, the time you've taken to actually present that to, to us. Um, just, um, just before we move into to q and I just wanted to, to just um, to recap on, on what you've just been saying around the importance of reinforcing the the, the early bystander CPR component. I think that is just such an important thing. And as you say, um, the British Heart Foundation has been working for, for many years in, in, in um, helping to grow that nation of lifesavers through a variety of, 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 um, of routes. So thank you. Um, so, um, before, so, so, so I'm now going to hand over to Charlotte. Um, who's going to go through the pre so a, a number of pre-submitted questions. And I think there's been quite a few questions I've seen that have been coming through on the chat bar as, as we've been uh, going through today's presentations. So over to you, Charlotte. Thank you, Jenny. Um, yeah, please keep your questions coming in. We've had a few already and we've got some pre-submitted ones. So I'll just go straight into those. So we have quite a few for you, Simon. Um, the first one is if you have a pacemaker, how will it work? And will CPR still be appropriate if you suspect a cardiac arrest? Uh, that's a very good question. It's a very common question. A lot of people ask this. Uh, there are several different types of pacemakers, so it's difficult to give a full comprehensive answer, you know, covering every single type of pacemaker. But broadly speaking, pacemakers are, they, they don't carry on functioning if the heart is going faster than the pacemaker, the pacemaker is set to. And what, what that means is, say, for example, your heart rate is 100 and the pacemaker is set at 70 beats per minute, then the pacemaker won't do anything. It'll just monitor the heart and it will just cut in if the heart goes slow. So if the heart's going fast, it, it won't do anything. It will just be there uh, monitoring the heart rhythm. Uh, if you uh, do CPR on somebody with a pacemaker, you are very, very unlikely to cause any harm to the pacemaker at all. So that's not a reason not to do CPR. You won't damage yourself. You won't shock yourself from the pacemaker. Um, you won't do yourself any harm and you're unlikely to do the patient any harm. So that shouldn't have any bearing on whether you do CPR. If you use a defibrillator in somebody with a pacemaker, uh, it almost certainly won't have any bad effect on the pacemaker. It may inhibit it for a few seconds. And usually what we say, if somebody has used a defibrillator and somebody with a pacemaker is we'll just do a pacemaker check afterwards once the patient's been resuscitated in hospital. Uh, but again, it's not a reason not to use, the, use a defibrillator. If you happen to be trained and you know where the pacemaker is, then you try and put the defibrillator paddles away from the pacemaker. So for example, if you're right-handed, usually the pacemaker will be on the left-hand side up here on the left, just below the left shoulder. And normally we would put the pacemaker leads, uh, pacemaker paddles on the other side. So over on the right hand side anteriorly and over the apex of the heart, over the left side. So away from the pacemaker, so it won't cause any damage. But even if you do defibrillate over a pacemaker, you're unlikely to cause it any lasting damage. And the benefits are so far out, outweigh any risks that uh, there's no reason not to. Now, the other type of pacemaker is the type that's also a defibrillator, you know, is an internal defibrillator and that you will occasionally see people that have had a cardiac arrest and have an internal defibrillator. It's not like common because the whole point of the internal defibrillator is it should work and it should take them out of cardiac arrest. But if it hasn't worked, again, it's not a reason not to perform CPR and not to perform resuscitation, not to perform um, defibrillation. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Simon. We have another one here. Um, how easy is it to operate a defibrillator? Uh, that again is a little bit difficult to answer because it depends on the type and, and the bake, but the ones that are public access defibrillators that are just, they're, de they're designed for the public, they're designed to be, to be very, very easy to use. And they have very simple instructions on them. They will have the defibrillator pads already connected by leads to the defibrillator, and they will have very clear instructions on the front of them as to where to put them, where to place them on the body. Um, and it's usually just a simple matter of turning it on pressing a button and it's, I mean, they're really, really clearly marked and very easy to use and very safe. Um, so I would encourage people, if you look at, uh, you know, the British Heart Foundation have got a lot of resources and so has the Resuscitation Council. And I mentioned a website to look at, the Lifesaver website. They have inf information on there on how to use the defibrillators. It's very easy. Brilliant, thank you, Simon. Um, just the last one of the pre-submitted questions as well. It says, a while ago, survival rates for patients receiving CPR was very poor. Has the percentage of survivors increased over the past few years? Yeah, interesting question. In fact, I, I saw that. I, I actually had a graph in of the survival rates, and the survival rates have been increasing year on year. Both the survival rates of patients getting CPR and the survival to hospital and the survival out of hospital have been increasing year on year. Um, so it's a very good question. And yes, they are increasing. Uh, I think a lot of that's due to people being trained in how to do CPR correctly. And also because a lot of more people have been trained. So you're more, much more likely to, to receive CPR. So a very good question. And yes, the, the rates are progressively increasing. But, you know, British Heart Foundation's work's not done until it's approaching 100%. Thank you, Simon. Um, I've got a few questions here for you too, Jenny. Um, so I've got one, how can I make sure I remember CPR after doing training and do I need to revise the techniques every so often? Maybe Simon might be able to answer this as well. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, if I, if, I, if I start and Simon, feel free to fill in the gaps if I, if I miss anything. But I think uh, our view is that like any training, it's important that resuscitation skills are refreshed regularly. Um, for some guidance, skills should be refreshed, refreshed uh, approximately once a year as, as a minimum, um, but it's really about building confidence. So if you feel that you need to do it more frequently, do it more frequently. And the Reviver Act is, is a great resource in order to do that. It's free. You can do it in your own time. You can do it in the comfort of your own home. It also has a defib awareness component. So it, it teaches you how to use a defibrillator and build confidence that way. And I think confidence is a really important part component of that so so I think that that's the emphasis there there's lots of resources as Simon's already said on our website we also have a, a an interactive tool now which means that you can use your mobile phone you can use a pillow or a cushion and it will actually take you through it even has an automated um uh, uh, emergency call so it, it it's it's a 999 simulated call so you can you can really practice that way and that does help to build confidence Thanks, Jenny. Um, and I'll I just say very, very quickly, I just say, I mean, I agree once a year is probably reasonable. And, and just to put that in perspective, you know, we undergo regular basic CPR training as well. Uh, it's not just the public, we all do. Um, the, the problem, of course, with CPR training is that most people that get CPR training never actually get to use it in a real scenario. So it is, it is important to get, to get retrained, get refreshed once a year. Um, and don't worry about doing CPR. You're very unlikely to do a patient any harm. You don't have to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. I know there's a real worry about that with COVID. Um, just chest compressions is usually enough until uh, emergency services arrive. And that will actually get oxygen into the body as well because just the, the, the action of pressing on the chest will inflate and deflate the lungs enough to get enough oxygen in the body for a few minutes while we're waiting while you're waiting for emergency services to uh, to arrive thank you simon you've kind of answered um my question a little bit but we had another one and um, is cpr safe to do if you think the person <coughs> you want to perform it on has covid or if you think you have covid uh yes it, it is i mean uh you know it's far better that than if you have covid you know, the patient in front of you is effectively dead. You can't make them any worse. You can make them a lot better. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't not do CPR because of that. 
Um, if you think the patient has COVID, I think probably we have to assume that everybody has now because it's so common. Um, I, I, I wouldn't not perform CPR on a patient that had, I certainly wouldn't even consider that as a, as a factor in whether to perform CPR. As I've said again, don't do, you, know, you don't have to do mouth to mouth resuscitation, um, which if the patient has COVID will almost certainly give you COVID. Um, just doing chest compressions until emergency services arrive is enough. Thanks. Charlotte, if I could add to that as well, um, all of our, um, our resuscitation guidance and training um, has been updated on our, on our web pages and they all comply with the Resuscitation Council UK COVID guidance. So just, just to, to reinforce exactly what Simon's just said, um, it's been considered um, and the risk has been considered very carefully um, and the hands-only CPR is, is, the, uh, is, is the, uh, the recommended route. So there's, there's lots of guidance and additional support on the, on the website. And again, Revive has been designed around um, a COVID safe approach. Can I just pitch in something as well? Yes, please. Like, it's sort of on that subject. And as Simon showed in his talk about the um, age profile, etc., cetera, um, I think there's this misconception in the public that to have a cardiac arrest, you must first have a heart attack. Um, but there are situations where there are inherited arrhythmias or there are situations where no known cause of the cardiac arrest has happened. So generally, if it's a child that has an inherited arrhythmia, the child has collapsed, people won't immediately think um, it's a cardiac arrest because they're far too young. It's only, this only happens to old men because they conflate heart attack and cardiac arrest. So I think we need to get in our minds that this could happen to anybody of any age. If they're not breathing normally, they aren't breathing normally, you need to start CPR. That's particularly true, the, the question with, with someone who has COVID, if it were a young person with COVID, I think you'd want to try and save their life and not worry about them having COVID. I was going to say that in my talk, I forgot to mention it, but I thought I'd just sort of pitch in there to a little bit of extra info for the... That, that, David, that's a very important point. I mean, you all, we've all heard about these, you know, the occasional footballer that collapses on a pitch, but, you know, children, teenagers, they do collapse on, you know, out when they're playing games on the rugby pitch, and that almost, in cert, cert, almost always is an inherited arrhythmia or what's called a cardiomyopathy, which is a specific heart muscle disease, which can be treated. So if you see somebody collapse, um, it's far better to assume they've had a cardiac arrest and perform CPR than to just stand by and watch them. Thank you all, that was really, really useful. We have a couple of questions for you as well, David. Um, so we've got one here. What has your follow-up interaction been like with your GP surgery and have they been proactive or did you have to press for engagement? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I need to be kind to my GP surgery. When I was chucked out of hospital, I literally had a carrier bag, white carrier bag full of medication and just told to go home. And the hospital had done its job. And this isn't denigrating the hospital. They're geared up to making, getting people to survive and getting them out of the hospital alive. There was very little sort of follow-up care from the hospital. I went to see my GP, um, sat down with him. This is probably about 10 days after I've arrested. And he looked at me and thought I was lying to him because he he couldn't understand how someone who'd suffered a cardiac arrest was now sitting in his surgery talking to him. The other issue is I think in the past survival rates were so grim that there wouldn't have been that many of us going to a GP surgery. So there were no real aftercare services or, or things for us. For, for heart attack um, victims there are, but for cardiac arrest there's very little in place. And I'm, I'm involved in some research with Warwick University about what to do for that and what can be provided. But I didn't find the GP was much help, uh, um, only because the GP didn't know what to do. Um, they hadn't been trained. And I think as if, if um, survival rates increase and there are more of us surviving, it's going to be a bigger problem for GP and, and local health services. Um, that's why there's work being done at Warwick University. But the short answer to your question was the GP just didn't know what to say to me. He basically gave me a prescription of some medication and said, come back in three months time. I think, David, to be fair, that's probably because most GPs have never seen a survivor of cardiac arrest before. Yeah, that's why I wasn't denigrating any, any of the medical profession. I say we're, we're, we're very rare, so yeah. there's, there's, no, there's no need to um, have services for us in the past. But the, the points you raise are very important, and, and it's for that reason out of, out of, and others that we have set up at St. Thomas's a post-cardiac arrest clinic, so we will see all our patients yeah. specific. It's actually run largely by the intensive care unit. 
um, but they will have a specific point of contact so they can come back and um, because it is a, it's you know it's quite a thing to 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 deal with and recover from and psychologically you know it's nice to have someone to help to just sort of put things in perspective there is a organization sudden cardiac arrest uk which was started by um a chap from essex who had an idiopathic arrest because he found there was nothing no help around so we've grown to about three thousand people we're a fairly eclectic bunch um and that provides mutual support information and pre-covid we used to have an annual get together um and it's good that you've got the stuff at your your hospital because i think I would say I wasn't denigrated in the medical profession. You all do wonderful jobs, but there haven't been enough of us in the past for anybody to think about doing anything for us. Thank you, David. Um, this question actually follows on from that. So it says, um, how do you stay motivated to keep fit after your cardiac arrest? Well, I, did, I wanted to lose 20 kilos. That was the motivation. Um, I start restarting exercise after uh, a little bit of trepidation. Fortunately, I went to a cardiac rehab class at Winchester um, Hospital. Um, so the first bit of exercise say, as I did, there was nurses on hand and they had a defibrillator because it's quite nervous winding up my heart rate for the first time. Um, I got through that, I went back swimming um, and I was determined to get my fitness back to the level it had been pre-arrest. That was a bit tricky because of the medication I was given beta blockers to begin with, which slowed my heart down and made me feel dreadful. And it was hard to get my heart rate up. But I, it's just been a motivation to try and keep myself as healthy as possible and try to avoid any other issues with coronary artery disease um, or, or, or other problems. So I sort of have my weekly exercise regime, which I try to follow. Um, and I think it's probably short answer to your question is health. I, I want to try and uh, have optimum health. So that's enough motivation for me to, to keep fit and do exercise. Thank you, David. Thank you for sharing your story as well. It's really powerful and it's interesting to hear your side of things as well. Um, we've just got another question here and it says, how strong emotionally are you following your cardiac event? <laughs> Another, um, as Simon said, you can be quite psychologically disturbed after a, sorry, a cardiac arrest. And there's a degree of post-traumatic stress disorder that I've seen in all the members of our uh, sudden cardiac arrest group that I've met, which I think is rather strange as we were unconscious, but obviously something happens in our brain. So there's, there's quite difficult PTSD um, and uh, emotional disturbance afterwards. Um, I was fine to begin with, and I went through uh, a time of a sort of sleep-wake cycle of going to bed, suddenly waking up, thinking my heart stopped, then going back to sleep, um, which was completely subconscious. I couldn't do anything about this, and that's quite frustrating. And there was some emotional disturbance, but that lasted probably about six months, um, has gone away. I'm fairly sanguine about the whole thing now. I can talk about it. The CCTV footage of my arrest is quite interesting. I, I, when I watch it, I don't feel any emotional attachment to the person I see um, uh, this happening to, which is me. Um, every now and then I do get upset on certain things, um, but most of the time I don't have the emotional disturbance now, but I, I do have my moments. So we wrong of me to say that these things don't happen. Um, but generally it isn't about me, it's about um, the, the horrible things that have happened to other uh, cardiac arrest victims and the fact that they didn't have such a good outcome as me because someone didn't intervene early enough. I find that quite hard. Um, and I'm not a, a religious person, but I think my survival is miraculous given the uh, circumstances and the fact that CPR wasn't done for three or four minutes. Um, so I'm sort of thankful that I survived it um, I think for other people, they can be more emotionally disturbed and they find it quite difficult to deal with it. But as I said, I've got a sort of fairly sanguine approach to it now. Thank you, David. Thank you for sharing. Um, and we've got one final question of, um, were there any aspects of your lifestyle before the cardiac arrest that you think contributed to it? Um, I was overweight. Um, I had poorly controlled blood pressure. I wasn't particularly hypertensive, it was mild hypertension. And I had a sort of head in my sand, a head in the sand approach to it that I thought via exercise, I, I would be fine. So my blood pressure now is more regulated with uh, medication. I mean, I don't like taking any medication, but it's a, a sort of evil necessity. But I don't think there was anything beforehand um, that really led to it. In my case, it's 
the debate is whether I had an MI, multiple lymphatic and heart attack, or um, I have one of the inherited uh, arrhythmias or cardiomyopathy. Um, five, six years on, the, the, the people at BART aren't quite sure about this. If it is indeed an inherited um, issue, there's nothing I could have done beforehand. So I might, have, I might as well have smoked and not done any exercise. But I don't think I did anything in my lifestyle that caused what happened. And I haven't really made any changes apart from I don't sit on plastic lounges by the size of swimming pools anymore. Thank you, David. Um, so we have another question that's just come in for Simon. Um, it says, how do I find out which hospitals are cardiac arrest centers? Um, so they're basically, the hot, well, the, the, the term cardiac arrest center or heart attack center isn't an official term. Um, but basically it means a hospital that has the facility to perform angioplasty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In London, for example, there are seven. We call them heart attack units. Um, there's St. Thomas's, Barts, King's, Royal Free, Harefield, St. George's. How many is that? Have I, got them all? I think that's all of them. Uh, Hammersmith. Uh, so there are seven in London. And most major cities will have at least one. Um, and for the, I can't really speak for the whole of the country, but I think for the majority of the country, if you're having a heart attack, you should be taken directly to a center which has the facility to perform angioplasty. Just while I'm answering that question, um, there was another question I see on the chat about what proportion of heart attacks become cardiac arrest. That's a very good question. It's a very difficult question to answer accurately because some patients will have a heart attack, go rapidly into cardiac mm -hmm. arrest, but will die before they receive any bystander CPR or, or anybody sees them. So we don't, we don't know exactly. We only know the ones that we actually see. Um, the vast majority of heart attacks that we see have not had a cardiac arrest. So it's the minority. Um, most patients that have a heart attack, so just to reiterate what was, it was explained earlier, but a heart attack is when the blood supply to the muscle of the heart gets, gets um, stopped. So part of the heart muscle doesn't get enough blood and that part of the heart muscle will die if it doesn't get treated. And one of the things we do with heart, in heart attack centers, we take them straight to the lab and we try and reopen the artery and, and improve the blood supply to the heart and stop, stop that damage. In a proportion of patients have a heart attack, when you damage the heart muscle, it causes abnormal rhythms. And that sets off essentially a cardiac arrest or can do. Uh, it sets off a specific rhythm disturbance called ventricular fibrillation, which stops the heart from beating effectively and you will collapse within seconds. Um, and that's, that's why heart attacks can cause cardiac arrest, but they are technically, they are very different things. So, to sort of answer the question, the vast majority of heart attacks do not lead to a cardiac arrest. But one of the reasons we treat heart attacks so aggressively is to reduce the risk of them becoming a cardiac arrest uh, and improve survival of those patients having a heart attack. So improve the heart muscle and improve the function of the heart. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, thank you so much, Simon. Um, we have one for you and Jenny. It says, how can I obtain a defibrillator for a local area without one? Shall I take that? Yeah, I think, well, yeah, British Heart Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, okay. So there, there's a number of ways you can do that. You can um, you can come together in, with, with other community group members and fundraise for, for a, 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 a um, to, to buy a defibrillator. Um, you can buy one directly from the BHF. And we do have a part-funded defibrillator programme, which enables um, community groups to, um, to, to, to fundraise a proportion of it and we contribute to, um, to, to, the, uh, to, to the rest of that. And there is that, that, that actually, that, that particular model has been um, paused during the, the COVID um, crisis. So, um, so we weren't able to deliver that, but we are looking to, to recommence that program in the, in the coming months. So, um, so it's just something to be aware of and to look out for. So there's a number of ways, number of organizations that sell defibrillators, um, but the other thing to, to do is to just find out if there are defibrillators already in your local communities, because an awful lot of them are there and people just don't know that they're there. And a, a component of the circuit um, that you've just heard about earlier 
um, is that we now have just launched a, D, a DFib Finder app that is that is linked to the circuit. Um, so we can, um, I'm not sure if I've got details to post on the, on the sidebar at the moment, but we can make sure that that gets, put, that gets shared as well. So if you look up the DFib Finder for the circuit, that, that you'll be able to find that. And that's a, that's a really good starting point because there's, if, if, it's, if there's something there already, you don't need it, but you do need to ensure that your community know where's, knows where it is in order to, to be able to access it in time of crisis. And I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's about a thousand pounds for a public person. Yeah, about that, about that. Um, and, and in fact, with the Park Funded Programme, uh, you, you'd only be fundraising for a proportion of that and the British Heart Foundation um, subsidises the rest. Thank you so much both. Um, we've had loads and loads of questions. So I'm sorry if we haven't got around to answering everyone's. Um, but I think this is the final one we've got of how can you register to be a volunteer as a first responder? I think that oh. might be you, Jenny. <laughs> okay. Um, we actually don't, you don't need to register as a first responder. Uh, there, there is a good SAM app, which has the first responder program. If you have, um, the relevant training and background so that's a slightly different scenario um, but, the, but the reality is that um, anyone who has learned CPR has, has been through the Reviver app or through any other training um, that, that is available um, and has the confidence and therefore as, as a result of the training has the confidence to do bystander CPR can do bystander CPR the first responder program is a slightly different program. Um, and, and as I say, that, that's, that's through the GUSAM Act. And also the local ambulance services have a, 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 a first responder program. Yeah. So that's where you can register for, for those specific um, areas of training. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you could approach a local ambulance trust. Uh, they run a scheme called Community First Responders, which exactly. I am one. So we're basic clinical training. I've got a kit bag, defibrillator, oxygen bits and pieces. And we get sent to 999 emergencies locally. So you could approach your local ambulance trust to see whether they have a scheme um, and whether you could become a, a community first responder if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for responding to that as well. Um, I think that's all the questions we've got time for. So I'll let you wrap up, Jenny. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Charlotte. And, and a particular well, massive thank you, actually, to our inspirational speakers, to David for sharing his incredible story and for, for being here to, to tell the tale. Um, and equally to Simon for, for sharing the, the value of his research and really important work. Um, so, so without further ado, I, I, will, I will wrap up now. But just to say a big thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, at, the, at the British Heart Foundation for this live and ticking event. Um, I hope you've enjoyed hearing everything that, that's been said. Um, really thank you for all your questions and, and, I, and, and also uh, for all your support, which I know you've been doing over the years to fund our ground, groundbreaking research um, and helping us to build our nation, the nation of life savers. It's not our nation, it's, it's our nation in, in terms of the, the whole organisation, it's the whole... Um, UK. So, um, so just without further ado, just a big thank you to everybody, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and and we look forward to the next live and ticking event, Charlotte. Um, before we go, if you could just um, do one final piece of, uh, of, of voting. Um, now you've listened to the last hour. Could you rate again how you would uh, rate your understanding of cardiac arrest? I'm just going to get the results now. Lovely. So 64% um, have said five, a lot. 30% have said four. 6% um, said three. 0% said two. And 0% said very little. So I feel like the audience have learned a lot. That's fantastic. Well, we've achieved our objectives. And, and I really, really uh, would encourage everybody to, to learn CPR, to, to download the app, or sorry, to access the, the Reviver app, build your confidence, find out where your nearest defibrillator is um, and just be part of our nation of lifesavers. And thank you very much again for joining us.